This is a 29-minute segment of a 1-hour and 53-minute DVD program about the Pacific Electric and the LA Railway. This section features the 1940 to post-war era, a time of dramatic growth in Southern California. The Pacific Electric is known for the big red cars by 20th century historians and rail fans just about everywhere. Its lasting fame is not a surprise since it was an innovative and expansive system built before World War I and the high point of electric rail development. This massive system once boasted of around 1,000 miles of track covering much of Southern California. At first, its focus was on conveying passengers from city to city to help develop land values and real estate building. Standard gauge railroad freight hauling was part of the business, and its growing importance may have been part of its own demise. This is the Pacific Electric at its zenith of development. It was such a grand idea, it has been partly duplicated decades after its complete abandonment of rail-based passenger service. The Los Angeles Railway, known as the Yellow Car Line, is intertwined in this same feature since it was hatched from the same original vision. The LA Railway, or Larry for short, was created in 1898 by Henry Huntington, genius of rail and real estate development. It was assembled, expanded, and upgraded from many smaller early streetcar and primitive horse car lines. The LA Railway fanned out to such extended areas as Eagle Rock, South Pasadena, and it crisscrossed the downtown region. It served the northwest suburban areas, and it reached communities and industrial areas to the south. And yes, Huntington Park carries Henry Huntington's name. The early Huntington standard brown and yellow cars with five window front sides were the dominant car type from around 1900 to the introduction of more modern types. By the time this 1906 built car was first rolling around, Henry Huntington was deeply involved with building the Pacific Electric system. The late 1930s newer colors added silver accents to these open air window cars with their enclosed center sections. The bulky Eclipse fender on this car was required by city law to presumably safely scoop up people that might wander in front of moving streetcars. All these early 1940s color movie scenes were shot by a 14-year-old boy with a movie film camera. Over the decades, these cars were modernized with better folding doors and fold-up steps, new front-end sheet metal add-ons, and safety fenders replaced the huge and clumsy Eclipse fenders. All these features help cut costs in a number of ways. This is the LA Railway in the 1930s, well before all the freeway construction would help hack and slice away various lines. Huntington's system helped develop real estate over 100 years ago when people had few automobiles and mobility from new housing developments to their jobs and shopping needed improvement to succeed. Transportation by steam railroads to other distant cities was made easier by 1939 with the building of the LA Union Passenger Terminal. The inline extended itself there with a turning loop. The depression of the 1930s hit the railway hard and the rebuilding of many cars to one-man operation, such as this H4 model, created a lot of resentment from union supporters. The elimination of conductors on various lines soiled Huntington's reputation at times. Next up is the O-line car with an inner front sign and the motorman punching tickets in a one-man car. Other cost-cutting efforts put small one-man Bernie cars on some shuttle lines. The earlier cars had passenger boarding at the back where the conductor took tickets. It was faster because the motorman was free to start the car's movement as soon as the door closed. 
The one-man conversions tended to slow the whole system down in rush hours. Let's take a little 1940 cruise around town with a $1 weekly pass, back when single fares were 7 cents. Welcome to pre-World War II Southern California. The long shadows of the Depression were starting to lift as war was igniting half the globe. And yet this country was still at peace while beginning to support allies with materiel and even preparing for our own involvement. 1940 would be the last Christmas shoppers would have here that was fairly carefree. All rail lines, even at this level, would pay an enormous part in the coming war effort when gasoline and tires were tightly rationed. The L.A. River was concrete lined here by 1938 after several epic flash floods that roared through here. The R line was mostly an east-west line. It ran from 3rd and La Brea east to Whittier and Brannock, ending between two cemeteries. The R line was modified over the years, but it lasted to the end in 1963. Henry Huntington died back in 1927, but his estate still controlled the L.A. Railway as a private company until 1945. The S Line also survived to the end in 1963. At the north end, it ran to Santa Monica Boulevard on Western Avenue. Or, you could ride it all the way down Central Avenue to Manchester Avenue. The V Line crossed the four-track Pacific Electric Main Line on Vernon Avenue. From Slauson and Santa Fe Avenue, the V Line crossed the Pacific Electric here on Vernon and turned north on Vermont Avenue up to Los Angeles City College. After years of picturesque but rattling drafty standard cars in brown and yellow, the new and welcomed TCC cars came to L.A. Railway by 1938. These cars were the last significant and successful U.S.-built streetcar, and they were far smoother and quieter than any previous streetcar. Their use of quieting rubber damping materials helped people sleep a little longer during those 6 a.m. runs past their backyards. Now we'll turn back over to early 1940 Pacific Electric material. By 1899, real estate developer Moses Sherman and his partner Eli Clark started developing the Los Angeles and Pacific Railroad. The LA and P lines are highlighted here. Sherman made millions in real estate and sold the LA and P to Southern Pacific's E.H. Harriman for an additional six million. Thinking beyond just the city of LA, the 1900 LA County population was 170,000 and it tripled by 1910. That influx would need home building and land to build them on. People such as Sherman and Huntington were willing to invest in electric rail projects to better market all their land holding in areas surrounding the city of LA. So the electric lines offered new places to live and transportation to jobs and recreation elsewhere. Let's see a few 1940 period Pacific Electric trains on the Venice line of LA&P origin. By this time Huntington had lost the Pacific Electric to the larger Southern Pacific Railroad in the so-called Great Merger far back in 1911. All of the next P.E. scenes were shot by Ed Minshall at around age 14 with his cadre of young rail enthusiasts that would save their money to occasionally buy all-day rail passes on the P.E. and the L.A. Railway. As these 950 class cars roll by, notice the painted white line patch where passengers needed to get on or off trains in the middle of the street. All the while, motorists would be whizzing by, rain or shine. It could be a bit harrowing.
This is on the Venice Short Line, running toward Venice Beach alongside Venice Boulevard, where the PE junction was called Vineyard. The line splits where Vineyard Avenue intersected Venice Boulevard, with one route curving off to the northwest to meet the Santa Monica line, and the other route runs down to the shores of Venice Beach with its famous canals and other attractions. This two-car train is heading to Venice. Venice was founded by wealthy tobacco giant Abbott Kenny. It had every attraction and entertainment imaginable, a fine beach, indoor ocean pool, and even a casino. The LA and P could really pack their four-car trains into this place, especially on weekends or holidays. These old wooden cars were a danger because of previous crashes, and the PE was only allowed to keep using them because World War II started and replacement steel cars were not possible. Patrons seated and standing are one thing, but hanging out on the steps seems pretty wild by today's standards. Even railroad workers are no longer allowed to do this. You can tell by the sand that this train is getting closer to the beach. Even today, some folks refer to this strip of land as the trolley way. This is the Venice Car House. It was part of the original LA&P construction. These wood cars were tolerated even for a few years after the war, but their welcome by government authorities was running out. The cost of new, presumably PCC cars, and much needed track replacement was many times the cost of replacing everything here on this line with buses. One of PE's most interesting cars is 1299. In these next scenes, its front signage indicates Redondo Beach. It is preserved at the Orange Empire Railroad Museum in Paris, California. It was built in 1912 as a parlor car. After World War II, 1299 was used as an inspection car, and the end windows were extended below the belt line to make track inspection easier. Twelve ninety nine went all over the system as an office and inspection car. Carpets, armchairs, a small kitchen, and toilet and other items made this car a favorite on some special fan trips. The 1948 refitting included newer paint using orange side stripes. This is a Bernie shuttle car with newer daylight orange side stripes. The viaduct was built to fly over this very busy auto traffic area in 1927. Autos were not only costing business, but causing rail slowdowns. The Nine Line ran from 48th Street and Crenshaw in the southwest through downtown L.A. to 3rd and Santa Fe. In 1900, Los Angeles had only 1,600 automobiles. Back then, automobiles were a novelty and for the wealthy. The transportation to more remote areas had to be available first before people would be willing to relocate a number of miles from their employment. This is Vermont Square in South Los Angeles. The 1913 public library here in the middle of this park is the oldest in L.A. and it was funded, with many others in L.A., by Andrew Carnegie. This neighborhood still has many of these early American craftsman-style homes. These homes came from subdivided ranches and farms, and selling these properties, especially to middle-class workers, was the reason the L.A. Railway was built. Number 1400 was soon Korea-bound. 61 H4 cars were sent to Seoul, South Korea by 1957 to rebuild their system, devastated earlier by the Korean War. This H4 on a fan trip was scrapped in 1955. Fans tended to crowd the front windows. It had the look of an overpacked aquarium at times.
The scrapping of the Type B standard cars started in the late 1940s, once the LA Railway was taken over by the National City Lines in 1945, with their characteristic yellow, green, and white colors, so often called fruit salad colors. Down in Vermont Square was a short private right-of-way running through backyard areas. This seems to be from some type of injury, or worse, of someone hit by the lead car. Tragically, many people assume a 40,000-pound streetcar can stop on a dime. The locals and passengers are gathered around the scene up front while cars stack up from behind. The southern part of the Nine Line ended in May 1955. The rest of it ended a year later. The company's most prosperous key line had its west end at the location of a huge Sears store that itself dated from 1936 in its stunning Art Deco style. This loop on the P-Line was made to accommodate the new single-ended PCC cars with only one trolley pole. This parcel of land served buses after the P-Line ended with all lines in 1963. This is a 1950s fan trip with fans already taking pictures before boarding the last of its kind, number 525. It looks like a relic next to the 1938 built number 3002 next to it. 525 had an eclipse fender on one end and the more modern safety fender on the other end. This is the street that divided the South Park shops and yards. The fan trip is underway with a 525 bringing its safety fender end toward us. When National City Lines bought the LA Railway in 1945, it became the pattern for a number of other streetcar lines. The new fruit salad colors were rushed in. Streetcar lines all over the U.S. were shutting down at a brisk pace. When the new LA Transit Lines, or LATL, took over in January 1945, many thought it would soon be all buses. In December 1946, those many were surprised and relieved for a time when the new LATL bought 40 new PCC cars with many refinements. These cars were wider and roomier with wider aisleways, all electric and no air operated accessories, tilted back windshields to reduce glare, better air ventilation, dash lights to light street island boarding, and most welcome, tinted standee windows, so passengers in standing room only situations didn't need to crouch really low to see if their stop was coming up. These P3 models enhanced safety with vertically split windows to make hanging arms and elbows out the opened windows much less practical. 3146 was in service by October 1946, Before the PCC cars, the LA Railway ordered a pair of St. Louis car built Peter Witt type cars in 1928, before the start of a hoped for sweeping order. These cars were very advanced for the time and they were built under license all over the world. They served well here, but the depression took that plan off the table. The upgrade would have to wait until the 1938 order for PCC cars. The aged trolleys in the background will be subject to more scrapping once all the new PCC cars have arrived. This is the moving transfer table that connected numerous storage tracks to the numerous shop doorways. Along with the J and P lines, the R line was modernized and converted to all PCC cars by late 1948. These PCC cars needed turning on loops or Ys at their end points, such as this one added on North Larchmont. Originally, North Larchmont was served by the three line, 
but that was changed to be part of the R line in August 1947, at the same time when the 3 line was converted to rubber tired electric trolley buses. Let's go on 3rd Street near Hudson Avenue and see some electric buses or trolley coaches as they were called. The electric overhead required twin poles and wire conductors since there was no return path to any rails. The LATL tried to sell the public that these buses could move all the way to the curbside for patron safety. Look at the length of those trolley poles. But the public wasn't buying that. They liked their PCC cars better. There was the Three Stooges short film called False Alarms, with them slaloming around the streetcar poles and dodging LA railway trolleys in a fire captain's car right down this street. We'll watch a PCC turn north at this corner on the revised R-Line. By July 1948, the east end of the R-Line was cut back to 1st in Vermont. The homes in this neighborhood are just as beautiful now as they were in these early 1950s scenes when this was shot. This temporary shoe fly pair of tracks was laid to reroute and accommodate the building of more new freeways in January 1953. This was once the location of a very large Cadillac dealer. The LA Railway was sold to the National City Lines in January 1945. Most people know they favored converting streetcar lines into bus lines since 1936. The colors on the LATL cars were showing up in other cities where the same conversion was going on. The El Paso City Line in Texas got 17 nice PCC cars to replace older worn out street cars on the lines that crossed the border into Juarez, Mexico. The Mexican government had their reasons for only allowing street cars into its city and not buses. El Paso got buses on the rest of the system. The PCC cars came from the San Diego streetcar line that was converted to buses as well. Here's a look at the original paint colors of the El Paso cars when they were still enjoying the best climate in the U.S. back in San Diego, California. This is at the Santa Fe Passenger Depot. Back in El Paso, a PCC runs by with its signage indicating Juarez. It ended by 1973 when Mexican merchants noticed that they were losing more commerce than they were gaining with the streetcar connection. The transit line's shield and the colors and slogans were the same as in the Oakland and Berkeley side of the San Francisco Bay, known as the Key System. First, the smaller trolleys were gone by 1948. They are the green lines on the map. The yellow lines of the heavy articulated monsters that crossed the Bay Bridge were gone by 1958. The buses, of course, replaced all of it. Here the bridge units are mothballed in the key system yard, waiting to be scrapped or sold to Argentina. This system was started by the famous Borac Smith and a man named Frank Havens. At the same time, Huntington was building transit lines for the same reason, to develop subdivided land for homes. The transportation made land selling far easier back then. The concrete ramp remnants were for another line here originally owned by the Southern Pacific Railroad. This system ended by 1941, making these cars, nicknamed blimps, surplus. 
Many eventually wound up on the Pacific Electric, hauling shipyard workers by the thousands every day to Long Beach during World War II. Once the war was over, the freeway building went into a fast pace to make more room for the fast and desirable new automobiles. The new Harbor Freeway was pushing its way to San Pedro and would spell eventual doom to the PE's inner urban lines in that direction. By now, supplemented by buses, the LATL streetcar lines did their best to navigate these new and changing waters. The remaining tracks, girding and meshing the downtown area, still had a useful purpose for a while longer. Downtown streets were filled with people in their new cars. They were annoyed at these huge windshield-filling trolleys blocking their vision and forward progress. It was hard for motorists to understand that one streetcar could remove a number of automobiles on a street. When motorists noticed streetcars ambling by essentially empty, it sent a bad message to motorists. The V-Line was a money loser even in 1940. It ran to the LA City College in the north, down Vermont Avenue, past numerous commercial businesses to run east on Vernon Avenue, and then turn on Pacific Boulevard, where there were plenty of mixed industrial jobs. Of course, once World War II started, severe gasoline and tire restrictions made the streetcars the force-fit way for workers to access those jobs down in the city of Vernon's industrial area. With the end of the war by late 1945, those restrictions were lifted. New car production would be soaring by these 1954 scenes, and streetcar ridership would sag deeply back into the doldrums. The LA Railway brought workers here, at least until their good employment earned them a new post-war automobile. Despite patron losses, the V-Line managed to exist until the very end in 1963. This Type B car in LA Railway colors is at the very end of the V part of service stub. This was the Vermont Central Manufacturing District. The J-Line shared some track down in Vernon. The J-Line was from Jefferson and 9th Avenue, swinging up Grand Avenue, to reach downtown, and eventually wind up back down in Vernon and Huntington Park. Returning to the V-Line scenes, we find an empty type H4. It was scrapped by 1955. Since the 1920s, the Automobile Club of Southern California had signs like this porcelain enameled one all over the state to help motorists. Notice the open window sections on the ends with only a pull-down shade. The center section had closable windows and it was better on the odd rainy or cold day. The city of Vernon had a tiny population of actual residents, typically fewer than 150. This full historic program is available on DVD from our website. Be sure to like and subscribe to our channel. It helps bring more fine material to YouTube.